Welcome one and all to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. We're talking once again about one of our audience's favorite topics, <laughs> Batman 89. Keaton Those... Batman, motherfucker! <laughs> ben Man Are you not here. entertained? <laughs> 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 We're doing it again. So, Ben Man 89 here <laughs> with... Drew Man 89. We're creative today. It's, it's 1989 this year as we go into the Batman 89 comic adaptation. Which, believe it or not, I did not own until this year. Uh, it just... Wow. It wasn't something my parents had picked up when growing up. I had heard about it for years and years, and then it was out of print for a bit when I was actually trying to look for it, especially for this show. And then, obviously, this year they're like, hey, maybe we should re-release, re-release it, considering that we've got Michael Keaton back. So <laughs> they released this. Uh, so I currently have the uh, sort of updated edition that has... Uh, not just the adaptation, but also the prints of the um, the original pencils by Jerry Ordway in the oh, back. Oh, cool! So you kind of get two versions of the uh, the same comic in this. So get your money's worth on this. Uh, so nice. Batman '89 movie adaptation. We're going to be comparing the comic to the movie. So there's not a ton of um, huge, huge differences, but there's enough to uh, you know fill out an episode and talk about that. So uh, we'll go into it. Let's dive in. Uh, but first, before we do, uh, since that is coming up this week, the week that this uh, episode is going to be released, if anyone's going to LA Comic Con, I will be there for the Geekscape Live uh, panel on uh, December 3rd. That's the Sunday from 3 p.m. to 3.50 p.m. over at 402A. We're going to find out where that is when I get there. But um, <laughs> Geekscape, we're part of the Geekscape Podcast Network, and uh, they invited us to be part of it. Uh, unfortunately, Andrew's not able to join me. Uh, there, but, I really uh, wanted we'll to go. Next year. I really wanted to go, guys, but I have to take a Japanese test that I've been t- studying for years for. So I've I've taken it like four times, failed four times. It's like it's a really hard test, but I'm taking it again. Just happened to fall on this exact day, and I had to. I'm flying to Seattle to take it, so that's another thing. Uh, so yeah, I feel, I feel sad about it. I, I wanted to be a part of this, but, uh, I just, it just didn't work out. Not this year. So, well, I mean, leave comments to, you know, fingers crossed on your test though. Hopefully. Yeah. Flying out there. That'll be, you know, you'll pass that one. And then next year you'll join me up there for uh, geekscape live. Assuming that, you know, we still have LA comic con in 2024, which we should, but yeah. So real quick, and we'll move past it, get back to the Batman stuff, but sure. it's called the Japanese Language Proficiency Test, which is the JLPT. People call it that for short. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's something that's kind of like stems from the Japanese government, I think. And if you pass this test, you can put it on your resume, help you to get some jobs, et cetera, et cetera. It's like a big deal. So it's like I won't know my results until mid-January, maybe even – late Mm. January. So I I wish I'd know immediately, but that's not the case. Um, so yeah, I wish me luck guys. I, I've been studying with a tutor every week, you know, it's been a lot. It's been a lot. Like I'm, Mm. I've really like the, you know, the silver lining is like, you know, that old school positive thinking, even if I don't pass, I'm, I think I've gotten better than ever. So it's a whole deal, man. It's a whole deal. Anyway, uh, that's why I'm not going to be there. Well, and good luck, luck, Ben, on your journeys. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> good luck to you too on the test. Yeah. So, like, wish us luck for yeah. our, our respective journeys on uh, that Sunday, and hopefully, um, you know, some of you guys who are who, who are going will uh, get to be there. And uh, you know, yeah, go ahead and say hi. You know, I'm going to show up is the uh, quick change Bruce Wayne shirt on one of the days. Maybe not necessarily the day I'm on the panel. I'll figure out what I'm wearing. Nah, you got to wear for the panel. That's a good shirt. It is a good shirt. I'll just see if there's, uh, you know, I I haven't looked through the complete schedule yet. I just mainly only looked at the schedule just to confirm that this was happening. So uh, if there's a something that fits with a good theme for that day, then uh, I might be in that. Or I'll change in it for just that panel. That might okay. be the way to go. Okay. So, yeah. Got it. Look Got for it. the quick change Bruce Wayne shirt. And, yeah, don't, uh, don't hesitate to say hi if you recognize me. So... Thanks, guys, and uh, I guess we can move on to the main event. We were recognized at the last thing the we last went to. Last two we went to, yeah. Yeah, that was that, that was <laughs> nice. That was cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. See if it happens again. 
Yeah. So let's go into uh, the Batman 89 comic adaptation. It's a little early, actually, for this So this slide. is Whoops. <laughs> not the Quinones, just for everybody knowing, this is not the Quinones yeah. book. This is at the time of the, this is released in 89. This comic yeah. was released in 89. So this is an interesting history because it used to be that they would do uh, comic book adaptations of the movies. Uh, so this was one that they released during a time where I think it might have been a case where, you know, you get to bring the movie home without it being yes, yes, you know, without you waiting for home entertainment because it wasn't like nowadays where it's going to be on streaming like a month from then. It's like you don't know when it's going to show up. So this is like the closest thing. Well, I'm going to tell you younger kids out there. <laughs> this shit. So from the time it released in the movie until mm. VHS which were those videotapes. Look up VHS if you don't know. Like, it took a year or longer. About a year and a half maybe sometimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe at the longest two years. That might be too much, but it was around a year or a little over a year before you got it on video. So mm -hmm. it was like a big thing when it dropped. So you're, let's get back to the comic. The comic was probably to help, you t help tide you over until home video release, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you love the movie, you go to the comic book shop to, you know, be like, I love Batman now, let me get some comics, and then you find <laughs> this, and you're like, oh, well, I can also get this for you, you know, to remind me of the movie. You just walk so. into the to your local comic book shop, I love Batman! <laughs> <laughs> and then the comic That's book owner's like... happened, there was Batmania at the time. The comic book owner is like, comic book shop owner is like, uh, we got another one. <laughs> <laughs> Third one today. Bring out all the the Dark Knight comics. You know? Yeah, Bring out all the Frank Millers. Yeah, exactly. So um, this was this was released, and uh, they have comic book adaptations of Batman '89 through Batman Begins. So uh, growing up, I only had the Batman Forever one. I didn't have '89. Oh, wow. uh, Zach, actually, our old co-host Zach, uh, sent me his copy of the Batman Returns comic adaptation. Um, oh, nice. So. We can we'll be covering that uh, next week, actually, or the next episode, I should say. And uh, then when Batman Begins came out, you know, I'm already in high school at that point, but I'm like, yeah, I'll pick it up anyway. And I picked it up with a collection of um, other stories that are part of it. And then after that, that was it. There were no more comic adaptations. There's no comic adaptation of The Dark Knight or any of the others afterwards. So it kind of stopped with that. Uh, right, so right. It might, could have just been that they feel like, you know what, this is just redundant now given the times, uh, just a lot of money for an experience that's just, you know, in, in many cases, not as good as watching the, the final film. So uh, <laughs> I think uh, for this, what's, what is cool about it, though, is it does have some little moments or deleted scenes or, or alternate takes that uh, are not in the final movie. And you kind of see that with, with uh, across all the other different adaptations. But uh, this one specifically, I think, is one of the most beloved, partially due to the art, you know, Jerry Ordway does the art for this one. It does look and, cool. Uh, it does, yeah. It, it looks really awesome, and and I think it's uh, this might be considered one of the best uh, out of them. The uh, the Batman Begins comic oh. adaptation. It's the uh, the close ups <laughs> are good, but the background, dude. Like, uh, we'll, we'll we'll eventually cover it. Like, uh, there's literally a smiley face as Flash's face in one of the one of the panels. What? It, it was shocking <laughs> how lazy the background art was. was it, in the Batman Begins. Life, was Liefeld on the case for this one or what? <laughs> <laughs> what Batman's chest looked like. <laughs> That's it's how just, we'll, just, we'll get to the bottom fine. of it. Yeah. I set a cup on that thing. Liefeld probably would have done better. <laughs> My apologies to that artist, but Jesus Christ. Dude, he probably had a terrible uh, deadline for one. But um, <laughs> This is due to, shit that's due tomorrow. Think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> think about thing about Liefeld is like, of course he, you know, artwork is what it is, but mm -hmm. don't we all talk about his ass? It's like <laughs> he's kind of famous for in that way. He kind of worked yeah. the system in that way. I mean, that Captain America is fucking stupid looking, but <laughs> I mean, shit, man. It's like it's a part of it comic. It's a part of comic history in a sense. I don't mm -hmm. want everybody copying this shit. Mm -hmm. If I'm fine with there just being one Liefeld, yeah, and I'm kind of glad he exists because he's just so. It's just it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Anyway, smiley face also ridiculous. Yeah, we'll show that for the Batman Batman Begins uh, comic adaptation. But uh, for okay. this one, uh, I think all I might be wrong on this. I think all of the comic adaptations for the four bat, '90s Batman 
movies uh, were written by Dennis O'Neill, you know, the basically okay. the godfather of Batman comics. He's the guy who made things, you know, brought things back to being uh, dark for Batman in the 70s. And right. Wrote some of the greatest stories, created, co-created Ra's al Ghul. Uh, but uh, yeah, he is the one writing this based on, of course, the screenplay by Sam Hamm, one of our favorite guests on here, and uh, the late Warren Skarin. I want to just drink a glass of wine with Sam (laughs) Hamm. He just seemed like such a cool bro. Yeah. He was very Um, chill. You could tell in the episode. He was very (laughs) chill. I made this joke. I don't know if I made this on on or off air, but I was like, when I grow up, I want to be Sam Hamm. You might have said it in the Patreon. I may have said it in the Patreon. Like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like he's probably what sixty something. Like I, I, that's kind of how I want to be when I'm sixty. Yeah, I want to be like Sam Ham. Yeah, definitely. Well, <laughs> hopefully we can bring him back when because yeah. uh, he we've got uh, the eighty nine Echoes comic, which is going to right. be oh shit that releases the day after this this actually uh, gets oh. released in the week. Well, we got to look into it then. Yeah. My man, my main man Ham wrote it. Yep. Yeah, Sam Ham and Joe Quinones again. Oh, so man. I got to I got to get it. We'll get it. We'll we'll cover. Yeah. We'll have plenty of video essays for each of them. It's <laughs> yeah. gonna be a lot of a lot of stuff to pull. Dan's gonna be working <laughs> overtime to get a lot of comparison stuff. Oh man, yeah. Uh, so, Sam Ham yeah. was he was he was a cool dude, man. I don't know. I I don't want to play favorites too much, but I like the guy. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. like the cut of his jib. <laughs> yeah. So we're Sam Ham fans here. So it is based on yeah. his screenplay. Uh, colors by Steve Olaf, letters by John Costanza, uh, Costanza, sorry. And uh, this is going to be kind of, we'll mainly be pointing out all the little differences here and there for stuff. So okay, let's go into it. Uh, so in the beginning, the first thing that I notice uh, is the fact that when uh, you first see Batman, so the colors from um, Steve Olaf uh, are. Very interesting because it's almost he makes it look like it's kind of the traditional colors. He's kind of gray of the body at times, but it's yeah. kind of ambiguous because it could yeah. be like, oh, that could just be the shadows. So I, I really like that aspect where, like, if you want to read into the traditional look, then you can. But if you want to think that it's the like the movie, then you can too. And so that's really cool. I think drawing all black and then having to have shadows at nighttime, it's just. It's also rough like that, like that, man. I'm sure they've done it in some comics. Mm-hmm. Did they do it in the Quinones one? I can't, I can't even remember, dude. Um, I don't think because Leonardo Ito did the colors. I think, and he, I don't think he did it the same way. It was it was less about the colors. He just kind of popped out. It looked a little bit more like, uh, I guess, kind of like the movie, kind of like the movie mixed with the animated series. Okay, got stuff. it. Stuff so. But yeah, it's uh, cool. He's cool. He did gray. I mean, mm-hmm. shadow on gray. Just I think, especially for a comic, can just read better. These yeah. guys look exactly like the movie. The yeah, I know, right? The you know, yeah, the criminal dudes. Yeah. So yeah. this is Jerry Ordway's magic here in terms of the um, helping to bring to life the likenesses. Uh, so that's that's another cool aspect uh, for this. The the lighting too brings up how it was said by Bob Kane at least had claimed. At one point, uh, that the colors, like the blue, came about because it was just sort of the lighting on the black costume. However, there are actually like several comics where Batman's described as having a blue costume. <laughs> you know, like the blue kind of just became the actual color, not just like the lighting or shading on that. So that did kind of get uh, all right uh, over the years. But you know, this the black and you know the black and gold, the bronze uh, look to this, the Bob Bob Ringwood look became iconic. So it is cool to see it in a comic. I got to tell you, dude, that opening scene, it's one mm-hmm. of my favorite. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I it's love a fantastic it. opening. It is like one of the best introductions to a Batman, you know, because like if you think oh, about yeah. like, the very first times you see them, uh, like it's it's tough to beat this one. You don't really beat this one. I mean, what does it say? Don't leave home without it. You know, all those lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, I love I love the, the thing they get like what three lines, but they already have so much personality. Mm-hmm. Who are you, man? All this kind of shit. Like it's ah, they do so much with it, man. Like like Cohen brothers, you know, somebody could have one line or no lines and it doesn't matter. Like they, they have so much screen presence and that's kind mm-hmm. of what happened for me and I think for most people in that yeah. scene. Yeah. yeah, that's like the genius, I think, of, of what Ham did in the beginning was like Batman's presence is built up, you know, yeah. talking him up. Yeah. He's, yeah. you know, this 
this urban legend right now, but uh, he becomes real very soon. Yeah. It's the fuck. He didn't say fuck, but like, it's the Batman, or didn't he say something like that? One uh, of those guys? The Bat got him. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I heard the Bat got him. Yeah, I God, heard the Bat so got him. Voting. You know? God, I gotta watch it again, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I love that scene, dude. It's so, it's so good. Great. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, one of the other interesting things in the comic adaptation is that he does not say, I'm Batman. Uh, because, yeah. like we've covered before, that was actually done when they were filming. That's not in any version of the script. Uh, not like it takes a ton to come up with the line, I'm Batman. But uh, I think that was before, you know, people do the whole I'm Batman thing due to this movie. This movie sort of started that. Uh, I think, for, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I got, an, I got a, a, a feeling about that. Probably mm-hmm. on paper it read like too, uh, just obviously way too on the nose, mm-hmm. and then m- maybe they're playing around. Michael Keaton's wearing the suit. Who knows when it came about? Maybe in rehearsal or whatever, mm-hmm. a suit rehearsal or something. And uh, just the way Keaton delivered, they're like, oh, I guess maybe we will say that. It you does know? work. Yeah. yeah, the way Keaton's saying it, maybe it'll it'll we can make it work. So I don't know. That's probably that might be what happened. Mm-hmm. Seeing as how it wasn't in the script at all. Yeah, the original version of this is, uh, well, in the original version of this, he says, you know, tell your friends, tell all your friends, which is uh, in the Sam Ham version. And then due to Warren Skarin or all the other writers in between uh, who kind of took a pass at it, the one that's in the script and in the comic adaptation is Batman saying, you're trespassing, rat breath. Rat <laughs> breath. Is rat <laughs> breath in the other versions? <laughs> rat breath is not in the other versions. It's okay. In, it's in this. I kind of have trouble hearing this version in uh, the at least from what we saw. Uh, maybe other versions of Batman and, and the criminal can say this dialogue. But he says, "You're trespass. You're trespassing, Rat Breath." And then the uh, uh, the guy he's holding up says, "Trespassing. You don't own the night." Which again seems weird because this guy's supposed to be terrified out of his mind. It seems like a weird line for him to say. And then Batman responds, "Tell your friends. Tell all your friends. I am the night." Which I, it's just it's 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 awkward. It's awkward. Yeah, it, it's yeah. very awkward sounding. It is cool though because I think this is the first time we hear Batman say "I am the Knight," because that line is cool. Has. Yeah, it it feels so reverse engineered. Like, how do we get Batman yeah, to I say "I am the Knight"? Okay, we gotta <laughs> we gotta write "You don't own the Knight." <laughs> exactly. That's yeah, not that's... awkward at all. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> no offense, man. I mean, you you know. You guys yeah. wrote the comic. You did. You did good, but it is a little awkward. Yeah, it is awkward. So that, that's that's sort of why in the movie it's I'm Batman because probably because they realized that it felt awkward when they were on set. But in the final screenplay from Sam Hamm and Warren Skarin, that's what it was. It's probably more from Warren Skarin than from Sam Hamm because I know that's not in the original Hamm draft. But uh, it's just it made it into the comic because those were the lines in the script that they were given. So okay. They're working off an earth. They're working off the script. They're not working necessarily off of uh, what's in the movie because they need this to be released around the same time as the movie. So right, right, right. That's why novelizations, comic adaptations, sometimes they have cut material because they get the copy of the script. They're going off of that. They're not going off the final cut because the author of it hasn't even seen the final cut. The yeah, they're, they're going off the script. script. That's it. Yeah. Well, you know uh, what? Wait. Oh, yeah. The author. Yeah, but the artist obviously knew all the way that these actors looked and shit. So he must have seen the movie. He, yeah, I think the artist yeah. is different. The artist had to artist came later. Make, artist came yeah, later. Artist, yeah, 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 so yeah, artist yeah. comes later. But the they kind of need Denny O'Neill to do the script and the layouts of like, okay, this page this is what the panels all look like, putting it all in you know x amount of pages, uh, and then that was probably done like locked in, and then they saw the movie, and then the artist did everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's cool. Really cool. Artist probably saw early s- cut of it. Probably. Probably with Ragamuffin, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that part is not in the comic, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that was cut pretty early on then. Maybe. Uh, or it was probably just determined that, uh, you know, because, again, they're, they're trying to streamline it to be a comic that you can take at home, you know, so that anything that was not super essential to the story got cut out. Yeah. Uh, so other dialogue stuff is that there's a different ending to Vicky Vale's meeting to – meeting with Alexander Knox um, at the end of the scene in the movie. Uh, he basically asks her to be, uh, you know, her date to Bruce Wayne's party and says that he, uh, he eats light. He eats light. 
Uh, in this one, it's a different exchange. She asks him, will you help me? He says, yes, will you marry Oh, yeah, he still asks, will you marry me? Um, in the comic, she says, do you snore in response to marrying him? Uh, and he says, I'll learn. So it's a different first. Learn to I, snore I, I, learn not to. Because <laughs> she wants uh, him not to, right? Joking. <laughs> I think he's joking that he'll learn to. Oh, okay. So this is, what, this is probably why it was changed. You know, I'm betting it was probably Robert Wool on set who came up with the I8 light thing, and it was like, all right, you know what? That works better. Yeah, this is this reads a little weird to me. Did yeah. you uh, did you <laughs> did you crush on uh, Vicky Vale growing up? You know what? Not really. I think we, again, we probably saw it I'm... way too young before before puberty <laughs> for oh, one. Yeah, I, I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't realize how. Kim Basinger was like seen by people until I was older. Because to me, it was just like, oh, it's Vicky Vale, cool. Yeah, and again, I know. I'm really young when I see this. Yeah, I, it was definitely way before puberty for me. But now, yeah. when I look pictures, I look at pictures of her, especially in this movie, it's like, well, you know, she looked good. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. We can move on. <laughs> so. Uh, and then another interesting thing as we go through it is that uh, the in the Wayne Manor scene, um, I actually don't have a slide on this because I found it out like very recently. But in the Wayne Manor scene, it's actually Commissioner Gordon who tells Knox and Vicky Vale to check out Bruce Wayne's weapons collection. So okay. uh, that I thought was interesting, and it, and it's kind of helped streamline it because Knox initially in the movie tries to ask Gordon a question. Gordon ends up leaving because he's you know he's hearing about the access chemical break-in and then Knox is trying to track him down and that's when he and Vicky end up in the weapons place here they streamline it and Gordon just Gordon is just like look just enjoy yourself at the party don't ask me more questions just if you're bored check out Bruce Wayne's weapons collection and that's how it happens uh um, you got it in Japan <laughs> yeah <laughs> that part is in the, that part is in the okay comic. got it uh Another thing I noticed is that, you know, people who have been tuning in a lot know that uh, I work with Newverse Creative and a lot of different audio dramas. They did a Batman 89 audio drama that uh, one of our former guests, uh, he was probably going to come back soon, uh, Ian Miller, who worked on the Batman Enigma comic, he did the writing for the Batman 89 comic adaptation. And I definitely could see a lot of influence uh, from the Batman 89 movie uh, comic that we're talking about. Okay, cool. Uh, because he puts that part of Gordon telling Knox to uh, look at the weapons in the audio drama. So, got it. If you listen to the audio drama, it's kind of, in some ways, can be an audio version of the comic. There's still some differences here and there, because um, he still says I'm Batman in that one. Ian was wise <laughs> to to keep that iconic part. He didn't yeah, put the yeah. you know rat breath. You don't own the night thing. <laughs> you don't own the night. What <laughs> so, criminal? I know Gotham is kind of fantasy, but still, what criminal says that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Good choice, Ian. Good choice. Yeah, it's good. Um, also, during this time, we do end up seeing uh, Jack Napier and company break into Axis Chemicals a little bit more than before. Uh, so, this is the part where they're in the safe or breaking open the safe, but uh, there's also an er even earlier part where they are, uh, you know, taking out the guards in the front of Axis Chemicals. So... Uh, just a little bit more extra details. I love uh, these uh, gangster dudes. Oh, yeah, the 1940s, like, noir guys. Like, this pinstripe yeah. dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're I not going to see that in any of the other Batman movies. I require all my criminals to wear pinstripes. <laughs> that, the fedoras, it's, like... Yeah. This just forms your perception of, like, Gotham criminals when you're growing up, when you see this movie. Like, yeah. I'm sure our audience feels the same way. So that when you kind of see like the more modern takes, it's just like, yeah, that's cool, I guess. But like, this is Gotham. This is what a Gotham criminal looks like. Gotham, yeah, it's a, that's the fantasy of it. I think it's kind of like still Art Deco and kind of a city mm -hmm. uh, trapped in time, somewhat. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's not New York. It's Gotham, so they're in mm -hmm. their own time. I don't know. Yeah. I, I wonder if Metrop Metropolis would be probably. The same way but sunnier i don't i don't know uh but yeah gotham it seems i don't know it's a it's fantasy man like it, it, mm -hmm. it, i would make it a little bit more yeah art deco yeah uh yeah. a little bit a little bit like this no matter but with modern technology they're just a a city mm -hmm. that still kind of dresses like this yeah at least the That's criminals part of the world yeah yeah 
let's see. Also in the Batcave, uh, the first time we see the Batcave, we also see Alfred talking to Bruce in the Batcave, which is not in the movie. Because um, we just see Bruce watching the footage. But here, I guess, Denny O'Neill thought it'd be cool to um, have Alfred there too. So we have Bruce asking Alfred to uh, play the tape when they're there. So okay, uh, interesting different change. Uh, another change here is that when uh, Jack Napier shoots at Batman at Access Chemicals in the movie, it reflects off of his like forearm gauntlet thing. Um, and that's, you know, it ricochets off of there and hits him in the face. Uh, in the comic, it's actually his cape that does that. That's cool. Uh, it's his bulletproof cape. So it's this little detail that actually makes it into the 89 series that Sam Hamm wrote with Joe Quinones, where Two-Face shoots at him, and he still blocks himself the same way with the cape. So that's finally brought to life in a different way. Uh, that would be a cool movie. That'd be a cool way to get that visual of him doing the kind of Dracula thing yeah, with, that's his, true. with his arm in front of the, 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 the exposed jaw. He's kind of <laughs> yeah. he's not running, just walking slowly, being shot at with the mm-hmm. cape up like mm-hmm. that. Now I want to see this shot. Matt's yeah. and Tomlin, man. In live action. Put it in there. <laughs> here are here are cries, it. dude. Mm-hmm. I'd love I'd love if he listened. We don't know if he does, but I've, out of everybody out of that bunch, I feel like he's a maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I see that. You know, at least to catch. We love the one imposter. Ep- <laughs> One episode, yeah, the imposter, all yeah. that stuff. Imposter comic was great. Yeah, Matts and Tomlin, uh, let us hear our cries, bro. Give us the cape, the bulletproof, the bulletproof cape. Dracula, man, in a sense. It is cool. Yeah, I, I like that uh, that connection there, because uh, it's it's uh, the old school vampire films. I think were cited by Tim Burton as an influence uh, in the commentary for '89. So it kind of makes sense that like they would consider the the sort of Dracula thing. Um, uh, it'd be cool. What like it'd also be kind of creepy for criminals. Like if you're being shot at, and the mm-hmm. guy's like, just kind of creeping towards you, like not really <laughs> yes. faced, mm-hmm. like like a monster to the criminal. Mm-hmm. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, it would be. I'm just trying to think which one, which movie has Dracula actually do that thing? Because I'm thinking it's the Bela Lugosi one from Universal, but I might have be. That it might actually be Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, <laughs> mate. You, you know what? Whatever it is, that move still looks cool. So yeah. even if it's even if it's not if it's not the best Dracula movie, <laughs> it's still cool. To be fair, I think it's been a long time since I've seen it. I saw it as a kid. Yeah. Uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein <laughs> in my heart is probably a better movie than Dracula 1931 <laughs> with Bela Lugosi. It's just, it's just, it's hilarious. It's, it's way more entertaining to me. Um, and Bela Lugosi is still cool as Dracula in it. Dude, so, I saw that Dracula movie. Like, it's a part of its time. I get it. I don't want to piss everybody off that listens to this, but I kind of it's, agree, dude. It's just, it's, it's just yeah. slow. Dude. It's slow. I, I watched, uh, I haven't seen all of them, but I saw uh, Black Creature from the Black Lagoon. I feel like that holds mm-hmm. up. That movie is good. That's like That's worth the best a watch. One, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the best yeah, one. You think just... he's got that old school creature walk too, which is yeah. He's got this ha- hands up, like I don't know. It's real cheesy, but awesome. Yeah, it's like the iconography of those monsters is what makes those. But then you look back at like the stories, and you're like, the book is way better than this. What the fuck, <laughs> only Dracula and Frankenstein. Like I remember us seeing yeah. Frankenstein with Boris Karloff for like the first time after reading the book. And we were just like, this is nothing like it. But uh, right. I get it. it. The you know the designs, the way that they look is you know they're so iconic. You don't want to fuck with that. You know, like the actual ones described in the book don't seem like visually they would be as interesting. So, uh, right. you know, Lugosi is one of the quintessential Draculas. It's just you know he you never see him with fangs, and it you never really see him actually attack anybody. Right. It's just all right. like part of the implication, but. Nosferatu is way creepier. Nosferatu, to me, that's the Dracula movie. Uh, I, th- so it's not Dracula, but the vampire movie I've seen the most, actually, is Interview mm-hmm. with a Vampire. Oh, uh, yeah. My dad and I liked it. It was long. We would probably watch mm-hmm. it in segments sometimes. But mm-hmm. my dad was always like, I like this one because it's in America. Other Dracula movies, that's in Europe. I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> this one's in, it's also in the South, too, right? It's, this, is in Louis, this is in Louisiana. I like that. Which you I know, guess is interesting. From, it's not Transylvania. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're from the south. Like I'm from Atlanta and Alabama, so originally, so mm-hmm. like I think there was something kind of cool about that. Anne Rice kind of put the spookiness of New Orleans on the map. So, mm-hmm. uh, and that's a good movie. I think it's still really good. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I think like Lestat and everybody else in that movie is kind of. I don't know. That I might, holds up. It a lot of up. lot of a lot of hot takes, but for me, maybe better than a lot of the Dracula movies. Dracula is very cool and iconic, but story wise, Interview with the Vampire I thought was really good. No, I I agree. I think like Dracula. To me, I'm a fan because of the presence and the iconography. But if it, when it yeah. all comes down to it, I'm like, well, it's Nosferatu, and then everything else. Uh, so I'm like. It's, uh- <laughs> It just doesn't like I, I'm just not satisfied by other versions. Maybe the Coppola one comes a little closer, but even then, there's a lot of stuff in there that's just weird to me. Uh, if they, but if they go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Christopher Lee's iconic, but I try. I've watched Horror of Dracula like twice, and I'm like, God, like I don't know. <laughs> like, Those were like low budget, right? They were like not uh, at the height of maybe. his career. I mean, it was the first. Like you got to see more fangs and blood, and it's it's younger Christopher Lee, and it's it's a classic pair of Christopher Lee versus Peter Cushing, but just the way that they tell the story is really like for at least for horror of Dracula. I haven't seen the others. Maybe those those are better, but uh, we have to cover it just for. We're gonna get back to Batman here in a second, guys. But Dracula is related <laughs> to Batman. But mm-hmm. Bram Stoker's Dracula with Keanu Reeves and Gary Oldman. Your thoughts as a Dracula mm-hmm. aficionado? So more true to the book than most of the others. Don't cast Keanu Reeves as John <laughs> Parker. <laughs> I love Keanu. That should have like you could have easily cast any British actor for that one. That was just it was distracting as fuck. And when we got to that part, um, I don't. I the it's weird when he's like this weird. It's cool when he's like a bat monster, but then he's like. They they make him they make all the different creatures he turns into. It was almost like too much in terms of how much of a beast he was. Like in in the book, for example, like he turns into a big dog, right, and almost like a werewolf yeah. or yeah, like a yeah. wolf thing to get off the ship. But then they have him in the actual movie. They turn him into like the. It doesn't even look like a dog or, or wolf werewolf guy. I mean, he kind of looks like a werewolf guy, but like it. It, it they made their own like monstrosity beast thing, and I'm like, this is. This is strange. I'm okay. I'm a little bit okay with the whole love story thing they tried to do with it with Mina, but uh, what's my issue with it? It kind of just it drags. My main thing is that it, 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 it well, it drags, but it also turns Dracula from this like really evil incarnation, like he's the incarnation of evil, to being like, but we should still feel sorry for him type of thing in the same movie. Like, the, it doesn't end with, like, a victory. Oh, yeah, we killed Dracula. It ends with, like, oh, she releases his soul back. And, like, the love is eternal. Uh, I'm just like, fuck no. This guy killed millions of people. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. What are you talking about? Right. So, uh, God, I swear we'll get back, guys. But I do love this conversation. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen it as an adult. I saw it when I was a kid oh, on, really? v- on VHS. And I remember my thinking was this doesn't look like a Dracula I know. Like, mm, I was like, yeah. the Dracula... Fr- I wanted, like, the very uh, stereotypical... Because I was a kid, remember Lugosi, this. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted him, and I wanted the one from fucking uh, Monster Squad. Oh, that yeah. Was, <laughs> that was Dracula to me, the fucking... Yes. Like, I know it's too cheesy for this type of movie, but... And, and I was, again, I was very young when I saw it, so I was like... I was grossed out by it, I think. And I, I dude, I, honestly, in a sense, I might not have ever really seen it in a sense because I don't think I understood most of it because I was really young watching this fucking movie, dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe I need to see it again, but it just seems long and not <laughs> not worth it. But Gary Oldman is awesome. And yeah, I don't but know. I, wa- I, wanted, I wanted Monster Squad. I wanted Monster I loved Monster Squad. And this was not that. <laughs> that's that's my take on it. So yeah, the, uh, bet- the the way they made him look too, like the, the way he looks like, is like the when he's younger Dracula with the mustache and the long hair. I'm like, that's fine because they're doing historical. That's cool. Glad the Impaler. That's cool. No problem with that. When he, yeah, old man Dracula though. They're like, let's let's make him a woman in a kimono. 
because <laughs> he's got his hair <laughs> up in like a bun. <laughs> he's like in this red kimono it's, thing. I'm like, it's like a geisha. Is, yeah, I'm like, this is really weird uh, in terms of the design choices here, but can't argue that it's also somewhat iconic too in its own way. Not as much as the Ghosty, but still like you see an image of that, you know that that's the Brom, that's the specific Bram Stoker's Dracula. So maybe it was the right choice. Maybe it was the right choice for them to do their own distinctive version, but in my heart, you know, the the image of Bela Lugosi or Christopher Lee, or even, like, what they do with Monster Squad, like you said, like, that's Dracula, I understand, even though that's not how it's described in the book, but I get that you can't argue with iconography. That's the iconography, like, that's, I, I, that's I'm, I'm remembering my little kid thoughts mm-hmm. about the Keanu Reeves Dracula so yeah. I was like, "What is?" I remember. Th- I remember thinking, "Like, what is this <laughs> kind kind of thing?" Like, I don't yeah. even know. This isn't my Dracula. I was already like that as a kid. Mm-hmm. Let us know if you guys have a different Dracula that we haven't talked about that you think deserves a fair shake. Let us know in the comments, and uh, yeah. maybe I'll check it out. Uh, another thing that happens in this access chemical sequence is uh, a different version of the cops trying to close in on Batman. So in the movie, they try to close in on him. Batman does the bat turn of his whole body. Then he throws a gas pellet, and then he takes off it with a grapnel gun. In I love that shot. The, uh, yeah, and, and it's a great moment, too. But in yes. the script, as well as in the comic adaptation, and I think they shot this, too, because we have a few photos of this, Batman almost pretends to, sh- to surrender, and he has his hands up. But hidden in his glove is the gas pellet, and then he throws it down. So it's a little different. It's the same beat, but just done a little differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing that is different in the comic adaptation, which I thought was interesting because they didn't need to do this, is that the <laughs> first time we see Joker's face is actually at the plastic surgeon's office, not with Grissom. Which oh, okay. Then feels a little weird because then you do they kind of copy the same thing too with Grissom. So I'm just like, we don't need like two face reveals. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. It's kind of fine just keeping it. Uh, over at Christmas place, but mirror. Oh well, yeah. Mirror. Got it is cool it. to see like what his face probably looked like in that scene, though. In this, it's true. It's again, this comic reminds me of just how iconic like every fucking scene in this goddamn <laughs> movie is. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's just done so well. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uh, yeah. And then the last thing before we move to the break is that, uh, ooh. This is a bit of a jump. Uh, but the fact that uh, Joker sees uh, Vicky Vale for the first time a little differently. So in the movie, he sees her for the first time in Bob's pictures. You know, she's, he's taking a bunch of pictures. Uh, right. But in the comic, uh, Joker actually sees uh, her on the news after he's killed all the people in City Hall and stuff. And she, like, shows up on the news being interviewed. And he's like, who's that? So, like, that yeah, yeah, yeah. is still there. Um, and then one big change from the movie is the fact that Joker says that uh, he basically implies that he already killed his girlfriend. He already, he's already killed Alicia uh, early on. He doesn't say the, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs uh, line in there, but he does indicate that Alicia's already dead. So that's different. Alicia does not show up in the museum and take her mask off like in the movie. So a little different. I think that was just their way to cut that character out. Uh, so that they wouldn't have to add her in later on, because again, they're really trying to streamline this uh, the story. So right. I kind of get it, but that's what we got for the first half, at least, of this. So uh, we will catch up with you guys later after the break. All right, everyone, we have November announcements, and uh, since he was part of the episode we're recording, Tim Maxwell is here from Nuvers Creative. So uh, Tim and I have a few collaborations that I want to tell you guys about, some of which you may have already heard. Uh, they, these were definitely um, produced very quickly to the point where they were, I didn't have anything uh, in last month's announcements for these. So I'm making up for that this month. Uh, so we have three to talk about. One is Batman Forever, Night of the Reaper. Uh, and that is an adaptation of the Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams story, but set in the world of Batman Forever. Uh, which has been really cool. So uh, anything else to add on that, Tim? Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm a huge fan, or I, th- I think the whole Val Kilmer Batman and even George Clooney, it's very it's very nostalgic for me and I think for a lot of people. And so I think it's cool that we've written or you've written a story and put it in that world. 
and we could just imagine uh, a little bit more of the the stories and what what could have happened you know with nice. Doc Humor's Batman yeah yeah definitely uh, and you know maybe we'll we'll dive more into it in the future we'll see yeah we'll see uh, this one is Batman 89 a vow from the grave another adaptation of the 1970s story but this time for Keaton's Batman as you can see from the uh, thumbnail that Tim did this is the blue and gray suit that you see in the vault in the flash and if you're a believer that uh, the Batman in the Flash is different from the Burton Batman, then you can use this as an explanation for the Iron Winch suit in the Kenner toys. So it's up to you on uh, on that. But uh, we uh, we I, I did think it would be cool to have different audios that cover each of the suits. So the original first appearance suit we did with Case of the Chemical Syndicate. This one, Val from the Grave, uh, considering that that suit looks very much like the Neil Adams style Batman suit. So, uh, anything else on this one? Yeah, I was gonna say I we had a or I had a comment recently where I think someone made the request that we make a story or an audio drama or, or audio story for every or for each of the suits that Keaton has mm -hmm. um, in that vault, which I think would be pretty neat. Which was actually something I remember when I was a kid and getting all the different action figures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't make sense to me that that those suits weren't in the movie. And I remember thinking, I don't remember seeing him in a yellow suit. Like, <laughs> I, like, like, like I love the toy, but I don't remember this from the movie. And so I think fast forward to now, it, it's cool that we can either come up with stories or use stories to put in that world that would validate or or give a reason for that suit. And so I think that's mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, that, that is a good point, too. There's not just because like after... After this one, those are the first two suits, and then obviously you got the 89 return suit and the one from The Flash, and then there's kind of just two left that are in that vault. Uh, but then there's all the Kenner variations. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of possible stories here. Yeah, it's endless, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the next one is set in the Dark Knight universe. This is the Dark Knight Fears. This is an adaptation of the Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale story from the Haunted Knight collection where Christian Bale's Batman... And this one is fighting, you know, he's in a rematch with Killian Murphy's Scarecrow set during the Halloween, you know, that happens after or in between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. So uh, really, really enjoyed working on, on this one as well. I mean, I, I like working on all of these, but this was one where it was kind of fun to, I mean, it's my first one writing in that world, you know, because I've written a bunch of the Keaton ones that um, mm. uh, some of the... You know, the, the Nolan style is, is actually very fun to, to try to write or, or try to capture. Uh, and the way that uh, the, the different Bruce's talk, uh, I'll talk about this in the episode, um, it, it becomes a little bit more apparent when you have to do something like this, where each Batman is narrating each story. It's been really fun. Yeah, yeah, and, and huge props and thanks to you for writing these. Uh, I think they're fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully uh, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have a lot more to come. But those sure. are the three that will have been announced or will have been released by the time that uh, this episode comes out. All right, over to Andrew. Woo! All right, everybody, talk, check out uh, Gaming Gaiden. That's my other podcast. It's about video games. Uh, Gaiden is spelled G A I D E N. Gaming Gaiden. We're on YouTube and on your favorite podcast listening app. And uh, it's a lot of like. Retro gaming, 90s gaming, and uh, also uh, Japanese translation of video games and that whole world. So, uh, And also, if you grew up reading Electronic Gaming Monthly magazine, there's stuff for you in there as well. <laughs> and um, yeah, Gaming Guide and check it out. Uh, probably best on YouTube, but it's good anywhere. Gotcha. And uh, moving on to the next one. Metal Force, so go to www.metalforce.ninja. That's the website for the project that I'm doing now. And it's basically R-rated Power Rangers meets Stranger Things. And it's a it's like a bloody horror movie that I'm working on. And we just finished our Kickstarter, but I'm announcing now that we're going to run a Seed and Spark crowdfunding mm. uh, page again because... The Kickstarter was run during the strike, and not many people could do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, first month or two uh, in um, in 2024, we'll run a seed and spark for people that couldn't make it then, and then we'll get to shooting after that. 
So, uh, yeah, please check out MetalForce.Ninja for all the details. Nice. And then uh, finally, last but certainly not least, in fact, probably the most important, is our monthly charity uh, promotion. And uh, this is for uh, the month of November is the month of Thanksgiving. And it's known for uh, having plenty of food, but unfortunately not everybody in the world gets to experience that. So uh, for that, we uh, are promoting No Kid Hungry, which is uh, a way for you to donate and support the work in food banks, schools, and and other places where children can be provided with, with food and, and meals and and uh, not go hungry, as the as the title says. So go to nokidhungry.org, donate there. Again, these charity drives, we don't get anything out of them. We just randomly pick them because we think if you're a fan <laughs> of superheroes, you should also be a fan of uh, helping others. Yes, that's part of the whole vibe here. So, yeah, that's awesome, Ben. I actually... Wasn't aware till we got. To, to, usually we discuss, but I, no problem. No problem. This is an awesome pick. I do love this. Perfect for Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. so so yeah. Please go to no kid no kid And with that, those are the announcements. Thanks everyone. Well, you catch more flies with honey. A hee hoo hee hoo If you like catching flies, that is, you stupid fuck. <laughs> and we're back to talk more about the Batman 89 comic book adaptation. And uh, we left off with Joker seeing Vicky Vale for the first time. So he's naturally going to want to try to find a ways to, you know, get with her. So what ends up happening is, of course, he still does the whole Flugelheim Museum thing. Vicky shows up. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting was that uh, we see a lot of different misspellings of Vicky <laughs> in um, the movie and the comic adaptation. Oh, wow. So traditionally in the comics and in the credits and stuff, it's Vicky Vale with V-I-C-K-I. It ends with an I. Um, but in the magazine cover where she went to the Corto Maltese, it's Vicky with a Y in the movie. And then okay. they decided to top that in the comic adaptation with being like, you know what, we'll spell it a third way. In the comic, and they spell it with Vicky. Vicky as V I C K I E, with an E at the end, at the museum. Oh my god! So <laughs> nobody again. This is nineteen eighty nine, so there's no spell check, I guess. But nobody's like looking over to see if there's consistency in the. If they uh, do it again, I would do. If they do it again, I would do V I K K I or something like that. <laughs> yes. I mean, why not? Maybe maybe point? it is. It's it's hidden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe Sam Hamm will just slip that in to the... Uh, <laughs> please, please, Sam. <laughs> the Echoes miniseries. While you're sipping on that nice Napa Valley wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so. writing your your tome. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, another interesting thing, is that the comic adaptation has Batman rescue Vicky, puts her in the Batmobile, Batmobile takes off, and then we go directly to Descent into Mystery. They're heading towards Wayne Manor. There's no chase. Yes. There's no alley fight, which kind of makes sense when you think about this. Is a very this has to be streamlined version of the movie. Um, the only thing is that when you take out the alley fight, uh, he doesn't necessarily have a reason to knock her out <laughs> when he gets to the Batcave, right? In the movie, right? Like does he shine he a light in her fucking face like he does in the movie? <laughs> like, Shut Actually, up, bitch! Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he does in the. In the uh, yeah, he doesn't shine a light in her face in the uh, in the comic adaptation. He's actually kinder to her because he actually t- fucking talks to her in the in the Batmobile in, uh, well, shi- in the comic. He shines that light in her face too. It's just so funny to me, man. <laughs> this, yeah, so this is the exchange in the comic where this Batman's a lot more compassionate. So she says, "Why can't I see out the windows?" And he explains, "You know, I changed the polarization of the glass." And she's like, "This is kidnapping." He's like, "Looks like it." Uh, and then he's like, we're almost there. Hang on. As they go into the, uh, towards the Batcave, she's like, hey, we're st- heading straight for the wall. And he's like, I know. Uh, she says, don't you want to stop or turn? And he's like, no. And he goes through it. And he's like, it's not a real stone, Miss Vale. It's a hologram. So oh, wow. that's what he does. Meanwhile, Keaton in the movie doesn't say shit except shine a light in her fucking face. <laughs> basically kidnaps her. So I'm still mysterious, bitch. <laughs> uh, and then in... Um, the movie, right? She took pictures of him when they tried to take the mask off. And so when he brings her to the Batcave, he's not only giving her the information about the Joker's code, but he's also uh, trying to get the film from her. So that's a factor. But in the comic, the thing is, they she never took a picture of him without the mask. So <laughs> he drugs her 
Uh, and uh, he just says, I'm sorry, I was wrong to bring you here. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit of you. a different purpose. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's no thing about her waking up and finding out that he took the film. Uh, so it's a very different uh, beat, but sort of maybe implies more that he took her there, not just to give the information, but also so that he could kind of find a way to introduce her to his world without revealing his identity. That's kind of how I read okay. it in the uh, comic adaptation. So uh, other aspect too that's cool is that in the traditional, like the very early old school Batmobile, not like the very, very first one where it's literally just a red car, but the time that it was an actual Batmobile with a bat motif uh, that was in the front, not just a little hood ornament, but like the, the bat <laughs> battering ram. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Which is something I've always liked. I know it's going to look fucking ridiculous on screen, but I've always been like, somebody's going to have the balls to put that on screen one of these days. Uh, but uh, I've always liked the idea of the battering ram. Turns out the 89 Batmobile does have a battering ram. And I'm pulling that up right now. It is that little missile dick part that's in the... Uh, the oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's come, supposed to actually come out, as we can see here, uh, in this part where he is crashing through Axis Chemicals. Like a lipstick on a dog? <laughs> <laughs> the lipstick coming out of the case? It's, it's like <laughs> lipstick coming off the case, yeah. A dog uh, dick. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, he... <laughs> Uh, th this part is is here, and uh, of course, it's added due to Joe Quinones being, you know, throwing in all these Easter eggs. He put that into Batman eighty nine issue number five, as we can kind of see here. Of more, uh, well, in this version, it's bigger. Uh, <laughs> it's Burt Ward's <laughs> contribution to uh, eighty nine. Eh? Well, Robin is working on it in this oh, yeah. in this panel. So. I'm starting to see all the connections. It's also a black Robin, too, in this panel, so... <laughs> the biggest we've ever seen! <laughs> this is like, I don't remember the battering ram being that big <laughs> until Drake Winston was working on it. Yeah, well... <laughs> oh, so, man. <laughs> kind of a nice tidbit with uh, the battering ram there. <laughs> other accent, other, Tid other stuff, tidbit, too, is that... Tidbit indeed. <laughs> yes. Uh... In the movie, he obviously drops a bomb in the Batmobile, kills all those guys in the Axis Chemicals. I think, you know, this is Denny O'Neill writing this, who's clearly not a fan of killing off, you know, um, people, because he even wrote in the sort of Batman Bible when he was an editor for the Batman title at DC that, like, hey, like, <laughs> I think he says, I'm saying it louder in the back, but Batman does not kill, is what he wrote in the, right. uh, in the Bible. So here, he doesn't drop a bomb. He drives past the, uh, the Joker's thugs, and fires at the gas tanks, which then causes the explosion. But we don't see any of the um, henchmen there. Um, and I think in earlier drafts too, he pretty much wrote that the you know the henchmen all like run out and stuff. So it sort of implied that he blows up the factory without killing anybody was sort of the original idea. Um, but that's uh, obviously different than what happens in the movie, where there's no way those guys would have survived. And I don't think we see them again either. Uh, yeah, they're dead. Another aspect. Yeah, they're dead. Uh, the Joker's dialogue <laughs> is different uh, as well. In the movie, he just says, up in the air, Junior Birdman, miss me. <laughs> Watch me. And then that's it. And Batman, uh, Keaton having good detective skills figures out that that means he must be going to the parade and poisoning people with balloons and then he's got to show up with a bat wing. Uh, okay. In the comic, the dialogue's a lot more literal uh, where he brings up that uh, Batman has figured out, quote, where I concocted my little surprises, the place where my life as the Joker started. Uh, so... Basically, hey, you caught me in terms of Access Chemicals being his headquarter, headquarters. And then brings up that he's going to the festival and invites Batman there. And he's going to kill, quote unquote, a thousand people an hour until he shows up. So that's wow. a little bit, a much bigger hint, a lot less subtle than in the movie. I love that Joker uh, copter. Oh, it's awesome. Just yeah, it's the, awesome. The, the face on the side of uh, the copter the vehicles, the patches that are on the jackets, like all that yeah. stuff is awesome in terms of design. It's cool how like it's really it's like the darkest Batman ever, but it was still toyetic as fuck. Like that movie, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything was really toyetic still. Like that's yeah. the, that's Tim Burton was really good about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's some parts of this where it's 
if I see more of it when I'm like at the store, I'm like, I'm always more tempted to buy that versus merchandise connected to like comic book Batman or other versions, other movie versions, or even the animated series. You know, it's just something about this aesthetic. Uh, and maybe it's just because that's what introduced me to these characters, but e- yeah, I think there's it's still something else to it. You know, it's, I know, right. It's like, it's, is it just because we were the right age for it? Or it really is just like damn near objectively better than yes. a lot of the other stuff. <laughs> like it's right. really not gonna it's not gonna be objective, but it feels like it to us. Like <laughs> it does. I, I, I don't know, man. I mean, there's sure, been some other there's been agree. some other there's been some other cool looks, but mm-hmm. especially like villain vehicles. God. Like it's, live it's basically action. Basically, this versus slaughters the best medicine in the Dark Knight. Right, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's we've true. Got but there's no, that's not really toyetic, but that was cool. Penguin's that was very Duckmobile, cool. Penguin's Duckmobile. Yeah, another bird. Two faces cars, Mister Freeze's ice tank thing. I didn't like that toy line, not dude. Great. But yeah, they went uh, way beyond the pale for me for the on that one. But um, I don't think yeah. anyone else had vehicles after um, after Slaughter's the best medicine, you know, because Bane just stole the tumblers, right? And yeah, then you got Affleck fighting aliens, and then Riddler probably doesn't even have a car in the Batman. So we—that's pretty yeah. much it after uh, after Heath Ledger so far in terms of villain vehicles. I, yeah, hopefully, like with Brave and the Bold, they get back to this in some way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, don't copy sell those it. toys. Don't copy it too much, but I mean, you know, mm-hmm. this is cool shit. Yeah. Pay tribute. Yeah. Another deleted moment is a payoff, really, of, of Joker saying that he wants his face on the $1 bill, where it's revealed yes, that yes. all the money he's throwing out to the, uh, the Gotham citizens is all fake, because this guy in this panel rubs off the ink and shows that it's not Washington, it's the Joker on it. So I love it. Uh, I do love it, too. I think it's it's... It would have made it even darker or a darker punchline to the fact that all these people who showed up to their deaths are dying for nothing. <laughs> dying for it. fake money. So, I know. It's so good. It's so good. It's good. It, and it's kind of a shame that that part's not in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other part here is that, yeah, the final confrontation has some different aspects to it. So uh, like we can see here, we actually do get Batman crashing like he – he and Vicky fall after the Joker falls and they crash through the window back into the cathedral and he asks her if she's all right. Uh, so that's an aspect that's specifically drawn in here that was not in the movie. In the movie, they kind of just stop and they just swing for a bit before we end up to the other scenes. Um, okay. Other aspects to the finale uh, that are cool is that uh, Joker does say in the script uh, and in the comic adaptation when he's pulling Batman over the edge he said, I saved the last dance for you. Sort of a call back to uh, Dance with the Devil in the Pale Moonlight. So I thought that was a cool line. Um, I would have loved that in the movie. That, that's a, that's too, one yeah. I would have kept. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that's cool in it. And then uh, Denny O'Neill does an interesting thing here because this is not in the script. But uh, when Joker's taking off in the helicopter uh, and about to be, uh, you know, he's about to escape, that's when Batman introduces the Batarang. Oh, and wow. Vicky's okay. like, what's that? And he's like, I suppose the media would label it a batarang, he says. And he throws it at Joker's legs, and that's how he gets Joker. So it, okay. it becomes, it almost becomes like the bat, the batarang's debut is taking down the Joker in this comic. I would have just said, pretty a, cool. I would have just said a line like, if he said, like, what's that? I would have been, I would have just said, like, you'll see. You know, it's just some line like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. um, I, this is one of those things that's cool in the comic adaptation. I don't think it would have worked as well in the movie. Um, it's too long. We just, uh, in terms of the dialogue or, or you mean just the idea? The dialogue. Of I'm, well, yeah, if you're the in the dialogue, middle of an yeah. action scene, if you're in the middle of an action scene like that, especially in live action, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just trying to, to get the word, yeah, they're just trying to get the word battering out there. It's like, mm-hmm. dude, just make them say a badass line like you'll see or, you know, yeah. you'll find, you'll find out soon enough or something. I don't know. Yeah, I just, there's something iconic about the opening when you first see him, like, snap the battering open to take yeah. down the, the muggers in the beginning to, like, make yeah, him see yeah, it yeah. until the end. I'm like, eh. And he's dragging him, too. 
It's like a scene where he's like, yeah, he's dra- he's dragging him in the beginning when he first yeah. puts him in the battering and throws at the guy. So I'm just like, well, what would, what would you do in that sequence then if that didn't happen? At least in the comic adaptation, <laughs> it kind of made sense because he doesn't end up doing that. He kicks, you know, he kicks that one guy, and then he sort of just grabs the, he punches and grabs the other, and that's right. about it. So, right, right, right. But yeah, cinematically, I'm like, nah, you did the right thing with the battering. I uh, yeah, it was awesome. That part was cool. Yeah. And then when Joker falls, the him him falling causes the gargoyle that he's attached to to fall onto the ledge, which then breaks the ledge. And so Joker, Batman, and Vicky all fall at the same time in the comic. Mm, mm, mm. Which is somewhat yeah. epic, I think. Um, yeah, that's cool. And it's only because of his grappling gun that he's able to save both of them. So nice. some cool stuff here. Um, going further, we do have uh, the cut scene that's in the comic adaptation where Alexander Knox is uh, seen once again. So the police sort of huddle all over what looks like Batman's fallen form after finding Joker's body. And when they uncover the cape and cowl, they find not Bruce Wayne, but Alexander Knox there. Didn't this uh, actor say he fucking doesn't even remember forgot. filming this? I know, how, right? How in the sweet fuck do you not know about this? Like, was he on drugs? Let's bring him on the podcast so we can ask him this. <laughs> Sir. What's his real name? I forget his actual Robert name. Robert Wool. Yeah. Robert Wool, please come on. Let's hear your story. Because, like, look, I know you filmed a bunch of stuff, but I just feel like 89 Batman was, like, kind of a big deal. And you were, <laughs> like, in the suit for it, well, for this at shot. At least had the, had the cape draped over it. Yeah, the but cape yeah, still, draped. Still. But still, how would you forget that? That's what I want to know. It's on a lot of Quaaludes, man. I don't know. Yeah, was it some uh, <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street kind of shit? <laughs> Like what I do that. It's just something it's kind of beyond me. Like if you forgot, you know, couple of the party scenes or something, I would have like, I can kind of, yeah. I actually absolutely no problem understanding that. Like it's, mm-hmm. you know, 89 It's 35 years ago or more at this point. Like it's a long time ago, mm. but this scene you're in the bat, you were at, you were draped with the bat suit. I don't know. It's just, to me, it's insane that you don't remember. Yeah. Um, there's some cool stuff here where he smiles, asks if he can still make the late edition, and then there's a shot that I don't think is in the script, but there's a shot of sort of Vicky looking looking over, and behind like a cathedral column is sort of Batman running away, and unmasked Keaton running off with a u- utility belt to uh, you know change out somewhere else. So um, that was awesome, uh, but yeah, it is kind of weird, right, that he doesn't remember. <laughs> uh, I, I it's and, just so strange, dude. Like, I, I, yeah. You know, <laughs> fucking like uh, Courtney Cox or somebody too from Friends. This is mm-hmm. before the Matthew Perry news. Uh, mm-hmm. They, she, it was, I think it was one of the women in the show, said that they don't remember much about the filming of the show either. Like, what? Why all? What's going on with actors, dude? <laughs> they f- fucking forgetting everything that they ever do. I so, mean, like, what's going on, dude? You don't have Aspergers. Like, if Jack Nicholson says. He's like eighty years old. If he if he if he says he doesn't remember some shit, I, it's because he's eighty years old. It's because he's eighty years old. Uh, mm-hmm. Fucking no problem, dude. You could forget. Mm-hmm. Here's Johnny. I wouldn't give a fuck. You know, you're you're mm-hmm. you're over eighty. Like I get it. But Courtney Cox is probably what mid fifties, maybe early sixties now. Like I I don't know. It's just insane to me. I don't know. I mean, there's, everyone was on drugs. That's kind of what I assume at that point. I, dude, or it just I, wasn't memorable for them. They were they had too, too many personal issues that day. I'm just like, all right, I just lie down here. Okay, cool. This is the line. All right. Anyway, back to my personal stuff, which you know, like, do you remember? It seems like it seems weird to us, right, that they wouldn't remember. But I can also see it being like, well, if they had something really big going on in their personal lives during that scene, it probably seemed to pale in comparison for them personally that day. It just seems maybe. insane to us because it's such such a big thing to us. Maybe for Fred Wool, I could sort of see that. I would love an explanation, especially after he comes on our show. But uh, <laughs> well, Courtney Cox or whoever it was, maybe Anderson. I can't remember who it was, but uh, it, it was like they forgot most of Friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's years, dude. Yeah. That's years of your life. And yeah, yeah. I mean, dare I say, you know, the thing that. kind of defines your life other than your personal family stuff. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like defines your professional life until the day you die, more than likely. Like mm-hmm. it's uh I don't know. I just it's just crazy how much actors seem to be forgetting shit. Yeah. I don't know. Uh also kind of fun is that Gordon has to clarify to the public that Alexander Knox is not Batman. <laughs> After they found him. <laughs> Don't <laughs> the worry, guys. Answer. The other guy gave us the signal, not this jackass. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also notable, noticeable is that uh, this is one of the few panels with Billy D. Williams as Harvey Dent. Uh, in nice. the comic, he does not have any dialogue. Gordon is the one who reads the note um, about like, oh, man. you know, when a sh- when <laughs> when evil rises again, just cast a shadow on the heart of the city. Call me. That's Gordon in the comic. Dude. We're of this age, right? And probably a lot of our audiences like this too, because we were mm-hmm. young. But like, I'm sure you were like this. Maybe we've talked about this before, but uh, like, we watched Batman '89 like a lot, and then mm-hmm. and then BTAS comes out, and we're like, we know we we kind of discover Harvey Dent and Two Face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how I did, because I wasn't reading comics that young, especially yeah. like so like watch that show and then rewatch. Batman 89. Yeah. Sort of pre internet, too. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> Harvey Dent. Was this guy supposed to be Two Face? <laughs> 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 like, we had this, like, you know, revelation. Yeah. No, like, I didn't, no for I didn't, sure. It's exactly that order, too. It wasn't yeah. just like, oh, I remember Harvey Dent from the 89 movie. Oh, cool. This is him in the cartoon. It was always like, okay, this, this random Lando dude is in here. Okay, cool. And then. I I don't I probably even saw it before I saw Empire Strikes Back honestly. Oh so yeah, like, I did. Me, yeah, it was always just him. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, me too. Then yeah. the, the cartoon, really knowing Two Face, and then just randomly rewatching '89, but you're like, wait a second, wait a second, that's the same name. Yeah. Wow. And he never became. He Two-Face. became white in 1995. Became white, and then BTAS, he's sort of racially ambiguous. I think he's technically supposed to be white, right? But like they kind of draw him. A little bit ambiguous, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think um, he seem he looks a little more like Italian to me. I don't think I don't think he's actually black in in uh, BTAS. I've never really seen quite seen that. I can see why people might think that, but I'm like, eh. I mean, I think they just wanted him to look different because you know, if you're going to describe like, oh, like he's a handsome bachelor in in Gotham City as well type of thing, I'm like, okay, well, you also want to make sure he doesn't look exactly like Bruce Wayne at the same time yeah oh yeah for sure but that that's been a some people have brought that up my brother thought this too i think thought he was mm. black or half or something but yeah might have been a slight nod to, to him as well maybe to uh maybe. billy d williams billy d yeah uh also during this they do shine the signal but instead of the sky that it's actually shine shining on the side of a building uh so that's, that's cool. actually the script uh, in the um, Warren Scarin draft of the script, uh, they have the they shine the signal on the side of the building rather than into the sky, and that's might be something they lifted from the Dark Knight Returns where they do that. But uh, Quinones does this once again because that image is on the cover of Batman eighty nine Echoes, the image of the bat signal shining on the cathedral specifically. So that's probably from okay. here that image. Cool, cool, so, cool. That's cool. Uh, other differences too is that in the movie, when Vicky's saying goodbye to Alexander Knox, she just kisses him on the lips. I mean, not the lips, <laughs> the cheek, <laughs> on the cheek. Uh, she sucks his dick in the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> she gives him, she gives him a blowjob before she goes on her she date. Straight with him. up, starts going to town on his ass. <laughs> she does go to town on him <laughs> in the comic adaptation, though. Oh well, okay, um, okay. <laughs> on his lips. Oh. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if they actually shot this. Robert, Robert, well, I'm sure you would have remembered this. Nah, you probably you forgot. This. <laughs> it's like Superman amnesia kiss or something. That's why I forgot the other one. I think uh, she just was responsible for this. Yeah, we have her to blame, dude. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, maybe it's the other way. Maybe he only remembers this and the other one. <laughs> it, this memory took over the other one. Yeah. That I could see. It could be. It could also be a case where uh, he remembers them cutting this or cutting this before shooting. Be like, "Nah, she'll just kiss you on the cheek." And just like, "Fuck, god damn it!" <laughs> I took a Mentos and everything today, ready for this shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. And then, uh, obviously, the last time we see Batman's a little different in the movie. It's that shot of 
Carl Newman, one of our favorite guests too, uh, in the suit yes. next to the bat signal. But in the uh, in the comic, it is literally just Batman sort of swooping away. Um, this nice image of him too that they've ended up sort of reusing over time. I think they used this in um, they used this in actually CW Crisis used this image uh, oh, wow. in, in like to hint at the '89 Batman uh, with Robert Wool <laughs> without Xander <laughs> Knox in that scene. So they used this uh, this art here. But uh, yeah, Man. that's pretty much it. We could IMDb it, but do you know offhand? What else did he do? Mm. Robert, Robert Wool. Yeah. Arliss uh, was oh, a big Oh, Arliss. Oh, my Arliss God. Was his show. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Arliss was, was his show, uh, which to me, as a because I, I never, I've never seen it. I think I was still a kid when it was coming out, uh, or at least maybe slightly older. But to me, it's like, oh, it's the Alexander Knox show. <laughs> you know? Right. Because <laughs> like, he's so associated <laughs> with that character. And then I think God. he's been on American Dad as himself. With them poking fun at the Batman connection thing, but I haven't seen the full episode. Um, I've only seen like oh something where he's got like a Batman poster in the background. I have kind of another hot but take there. I feel like with it. I feel like American Dad's better than Family Guy, but that's another that's another I story seen for another day. Though. I've mainly seen Family Guy, but maybe maybe I'll agree with you when I see track down what the full episode is with Robert Wool in it and watch well, it. Just before we get some comments about this, so to explain myself. I agree with South Park's mm. position on Family Guy where the jokes never really connect with the plot. And I know they're they're still mm. funny, but it seems more organic, I think, with American Dad. And mm. um, the son's a nerd, and like I feel like that's a little bit of an avatar there, too. And they, I don't know, I I don't really love any of those shows. My favorite show from McFarlane is Orville, I think. But, I can see that, um, yeah. <clears throat> And I love that he he got Cosmos off the ground, but like uh, like yeah, I don't know. I I think that's probably his best show for my money. Family Guy is, mm-hmm. is fine, but ultimately, out of the modern comedy shows, though, I think South Park's still king. Anyway, that's for another day. Uh, this panel is cool. Love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was really cool. So you did not have this growing up. When did you actually get this comic? This year. This year, okay, so you this weren't year really when aware they of released it. it. Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. it. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, oh yeah, you said that I in the beginning. To I to totally forgot. It. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to track it down for a while because I'm just like, oh, this would be good for the show because all I had at one point was just the Batman Forever one and Batman Begins, but I'm like, eh, I should probably get the others before we go to those. Uh, so we finally done it. We covered it, and um, naturally, I also found out that uh, Quinones was going to be doing some Easter eggs from it, like we've nice. seen, we've talked about already. So I'm like, I got to get this, you know? So Man. the next one, of course, is Batman Returns. Um, that one uh, does not have Jerry Ordway doing the art, but uh, it's still good. And uh, we are going to actually cover that uh, in the next episode, but that won't be for uh, a couple weeks. So we're going to take a small break here because uh, Andrew's got his uh, test in Seattle. I've got LA Comic Con. Scheduling wise, um, it just makes sense for us to take a little bit of a break, but we will be back for Batman Returns, the comic adaptation, in a unique place. So that will be part of the Geekscape holiday live stream that's on December 8th. They do an annual live stream with all their podcast shows on it. Uh, we are pre recording our segment actually, uh, bef- you know, next week before we do LA Comic Con or Seattle stuff. So we will have that pre recorded. You can see it though during the holiday live stream on December eighth with Geekscape. We'll send out, we'll promote the the link and stuff for you guys to see it. We'll let you know what time that is, um, and it's all to help promote uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Um, it's a it's a uh, charity. It's 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 to help out uh, you know youths in the New Jersey area. I believe um, I need to read up more on it, um, but that's it's all part of that charity drive. So naturally, that'll also be. Our, uh, our charity drive for December too, to sort of add on to that. Um, so you'll see that first there, but then the R cut of the episode with, you know, our break and all that stuff, that will be, uh, especially if you guys miss it on the 8th, you can see it again on our channel and our podcast stuff on December 11th when that'll be when we're sort of officially back. So that's when yeah, you just get to ex- see Batman Returns. Expect a little bit of a break here with the holidays, guys. I mean, mm-hmm. one coming up soon just for Thanksgiving and stuff. And then, or, you know, the break you just said about um, LA Comic-Con timing. 
and then mm-hmm. also around Christmas and New Year's. So, you know, we're pretty good, I think, about releasing kind of around the clock year round. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, the year end is the time when whenever we become a little bit less uh, consistent and then we'll pick it back up in January. Uh, mm-hmm. So just a heads up there. Yep. So until then, that is superhero stuff you should know. Coming soon from Newverse Creative. Riddle me this, Fred! What is everything to someone and nothing to everyone else? Your mind! In an uncertain world, in a chaotic time, Justice wears a mask. Batman does not kill? What if there's slain during his fight with Jack and Ape, the Joker? Love is a game. Let's just say I could write a heck of a paper on why a grown man dresses up like a flying rodent. Bats aren't rodents, Dr. Meridian. Power is a machine. Question marks, Mr. Wayne. My work raises so many question marks. Here's one for you. Why hasn't anybody put you in your place? And revenge is a trap. The bat must die. (laughs) Courage now. I saved your bat butt back there. I think a little appreciation is in order. Truth always. Who's the boy wonder, Batman? Experience the original Batman forever. Finally performed in the style of the Burton verse. I see without seeing. To me, darkness is as clear as daylight. What am I? Batman 3, based on the screenplay by Lee and Janet Scott Batchelor with Akiva Goldsman. Adapted by Ben Wan from Superhero Stuff You Should Know. My parents were murdered in front of me. I was just a kid. I can't remember exactly what happened. But now there's a new element. A red leather book. Coming soon. Big thanks to Dan for gathering the visuals for the YouTube version of this. All the different comic panels. Uh, let's go into the different fan comments. So, Uncle Patrick, two. Not my uncle, but somebody's Uncle Patrick. Competent on our... Uh, <laughs> Batman and the Shadow, uh, Batman being a ripoff of the Shadow uh, video from way, way back, uh, <clears throat> with a new tidbit saying Doc Savage had a villain named John Silence, I think it was actually John Sunlight, uh, who dressed in uh. purple and was an expert in chemistry. An influence on the Joker? Maybe. Um, I haven't <laughs> yet read a John Sunlight versus Doc Savage uh, story yet, so I don't know. Maybe. Uh, it's hmm. possible. The purple is definitely seems like something. Well, chemistry too, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They, I mean, you got that fucking, you know, uh, ride in uh, Coney Island. You got that movie. Seems mm-hmm. like a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. They were pulling a lot from of a lot. Influences. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, maybe. But thanks, Uncle. Yeah. Uh, Worldview3182 says, first time checking you guys out. Really enjoyed this uh, on the Batman uh, concept art episode. For the nice. Batman 2022. Subscribed. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Worldview. Uh, hit the Dream bell and subscribe. Remember, we yes. don't do this at all, but like hit the <laughs> bell and subscribe, everybody. Like, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, man. Like, if you're going to subscribe, you're going to subscribe. I don't know. Yeah. Like, please, everybody that ever fucking watches this, please subscribe. But I don't know, dude. Yeah. I just, I just like, I, we probably should more, but. 
I don't feel totally moved to, to say that. I don't that. think we should do it because I'm like, because that's just not, I've never subscribed just because the guy on the video told me to do it. Yeah, I did I've it never. I liked a couple of videos that the guys did. And I'm like, yeah, I should subscribe to these people because I like them. That's how it works. Nobody's ever, I've never hit the bell once because some <laughs> fucking guy on the internet told me to click the bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I fucking, that's one reason. Yeah, you're right. It's exactly right. Especially, subscribe is one thing, but the bell too. What the fuck is the bell? I don't, I've been YouTubing for years now. I barely I barely know what the fucking bell is, dude. Like, I subscribe to my own shit. I never clicked a bell mm-hmm. in my life. <laughs> I'll look at it, I'll look at it, I look at it later. I think mm-hmm. it gives you, look, again, just to, so we won't get comments about this, it gives you notifications more than just subscribing, I think, but... Mm-hmm. To me, subscribing's enough. I check my YouTube subscriptions enough anyway. I don't need an extra thing. So, uh, <laughs> are we just jaded YouTubers? <laughs> like, hit I, the bell, everybody. <laughs> hit the <laughs> bell. <laughs> I mean, f- do whatever the fuck you want, dude. <laughs> at this point, <laughs> like, I, I don't know, dude. Subscribe, watch this episode, don't watch this ever again, whatever the fuck. <laughs> like, Go to our Patreon. Well, That's where we really... <laughs> We make the, the the, the, yeah. we make the medium bucks over there. Yeah. That's the main thing. So, uh, let's go on to uh, a guy who's been watching everything that we've done. Dreamland Nightmare. Dreamland Nightmare, man. We love we love your engagement, bro. It was awesome. Yep. So, uh, Dreamland Nightmare. I mean, there were a lot of comments to choose from, but I wanted to just highlight <laughs> one that I thought was suitable, which is Wesley Strick. Really should have gotten a co-writing credit for all the dialogue revisions and contributions, which... Even Daniel Waters eventually admitted um, when he was on our show. So. Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it took him years <laughs> to get to that point. But he's like, yeah, actually did some good shit. That's our other favorite guest, I think, from the fact, last year was an epic year for those guests. They've all been, like, real chill. But, mm-hmm. yeah, like, he, too, was, like, it felt like we were just hanging out with him. Yeah. Like, he wrote Batman Returns, dude. But it, it at the same time, it felt like we could just joke around with him. He was just kind of mm-hmm. normal. Like, I don't know. It was, yeah, he, he was cool too. Like they've all been cool, you know? Yeah. yeah they all like, no one's really felt like, Ooh, you know, we got to worship them. You know, like nobody's been oh, like yeah. that, yeah. you know, even a, a lot of fucking nerds do, which is fine. But I love how, uh, you know, down to earth they've all been really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So thank you. Dreamland. Um, not able to get to all your comments, but, <laughs> but they, we've been the reading you, them though. <laughs> we've read all your comments for sure. Thank you, dude. That's awesome. I mean, I'm going to assume you. you're yeah. a dude. If you're not, you can correct me. But again, due to our YouTube analytics, there's a 99% sure. chance you are. Yes. I'm just basing this on science. <laughs> right. <laughs> YouTube science. Okay, everybody, we want to thank uh, Carlos. <laughs> everybody here for sure, but our more mm-hmm. recent people, Carlos R., Jack G., Put Your Guns On, Michael C., Leom O., Cyber 6 being the most recent. Awesome name. Mm-hmm. Uh, let us know what that's from. What, is that from anything you know offhand? Okay, yeah, it just, sounds, yeah it just sounds cool. Uh, and other supporters as well, everybody here on the board. And you know what? We've told you about our friends here, and we'd like you to do us a favor. We want you to tell all your friends about us. Rat breath. <laughs>